what's shaking guys look Nancy here I am very excited I have got the man that just fooled Penn and Teller that's right he just did this on their TV show not too long ago I'm talking about the one and only Tony Clark now Tony is not just full Penn and Teller he's also a student of Slidini yes the Slidini uh, professional magician magic creator creates a lot of very cool original magic one of my favorite gypsy thread versions is from him I'll tell you more about that um, he's also a producer and director he does a lot of magic consulting for TV shows and he's done some movies and stuff he's done it all and I'm proud to call him a friend and he's here with me tonight from Los Angeles for you Tony Clark how we doing sir what's up buddy all right all right good to see you, man. Good to see you. it's really good to see you and again a big congrats on fooling the boys thank you yeah, yeah, pin yeah. Teller. How cool fun is that? Time, fun time. How cool it was a good experience. Uh, you know, it's nerve wracking. You know, TV, especially <laughs> it's live. Basically, it's basically live. They don't reshoot anything. So, <laughs> whatever you do, that's what you show on TV. So that's why it's like, oh man, you know, shooting a TV yeah. show is different. But this was like, yeah. In the in the boys, but I worked on it hard. I worked on it very hard. I worked. I was telling a friend of mine the other day. I I rehearsed probably more for that than I did in last. 20 years or anything, you know? So. Wow. Well, and it all paid yeah. off and we're going to talk more about your TV appearance, obviously. Yeah. Um, but let's back up a little bit. There's a lot of history with you, Tony. Um, yeah. And I'd love for people to know more about you. I mentioned the name Slidini. That's a name that we don't hear enough of, I feel like. Um, right. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your history, you know, with that, getting in the magic and his guidance and, yeah. you know, being okay. where you are now. Let's kind of get to know you before we get to the, the most recent stuff. Yeah. I got you. All right. Well, like most guys, I started young. I was like six years old when I started. Got into magic, do my birthday parties at nine. My first show was at nine years old. Uh, then I started getting into uh, the magic clubs, IBM and SAM locally in Connecticut, Stanford clubs. Uh, that was great to meet magicians and be inspired. And we we trade, you know, VHS tapes back then. You know, like, oh, did you see the field special? You know, that's how we did it back in those days, VHS days. Uh, so that was good, a good exposure. But most of my magic I learned back in the day was from books, the library. There was no videos back then, no DVDs, no VHSs when I was first starting. All books from the library. Uh, and then I started uh, doing magic through high school and doing per birthday parties. Uh, it was a big business for me. I did quite a few. I did dubs in my, uh, uh, my birthday parties. That's so how I got the dubs. A Dove pan, Dove for balloon, and a Dove streamer thing I did in my kids' show. That's what how, how I fell in love with doves. And then uh, I remember seeing Mark Wilson do a dove catch with the, you know, the catching the birds and the and the thing. And I was like, oh my god, it was crazy. So I fell in love in love with doves about twelve years old. And then I got into doing a bird act a little bit, trying to play around with more doves. And then uh, I drifted away, got into powerlifting, bodybuilding. Got really big, up to like 225. I couldn't wow. fit in my clothes. I was barely doing kid shows, you know. Uh, and I couldn't wear the tuxedo that you're wearing. You see that now? I would never be able to do that act. <laughs> so I, uh, I, 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 then I, I met by luck Slidini at a convention at the Magic Jubilee, uh, Tenon's Magic Jubilee in uh, New York State. And uh, I just gravitated to him for some reason. And I thought, well, this might be a way to get back into magic. I felt kind of guilty about not doing magic for a while. Uh, it was almost a two-year period that I didn't do it. So, or not much. So I got, I met Slidini. I started studying with him uh, for two years. Somebody's a little over two years. Going back from Connecticut to New York City. He talked to me. I got into it. He gave me some really kind words, you know, and that really got me to realize, oh, man, I, what am I doing? I need to get back. This legend believes in me. I got to get back into it. So uh, I got back into it with him in a big way. Went home. I built my own table replica of Slidini's table in the studio in New York because I, you know, I know how to build. I still do, obviously. But I, I built my own little table. And I, I was I used to work for a glass shop back then. I put mirrors up on my bedroom wall so I could rehearse. Wow. And that was it. And I got into it, and I'm back. And then after that, I lost weight. And then I got into my dub act. And then 1988, I won the SAM uh, World Class Championship. At, in St. Louis, and that got me on the road. Really, that was the launch we had. And then for yeah. my eight or so months, I got booked to the castle, and then from there, I moved to LA. And then everything else started rolling. But it wasn't easy. 
it was four or five years, man, of sitting in that studio apartment. And then I moved to Eagle Rock. I used to live in a building with uh, Dean Dill, Doug Malloy. <laughs> and it was like the magic commune there. And But it was tough. The first five years, man, I was like eating ramen and chicken hot dogs, cheap hot dogs for dinner, man. It was like, it was rough. But I loved it. I loved the excitement of it. And that's what I tell people when they start off. They say, you know, stay in the game. That's the key. Just stay in the game. If you're not in the game. You know, when it turns around, your turn comes to bat, you're not going to be able to play. So that's what the lesson I learned from that, you know, being in, in Hollywood. I used to live right down the street from the castle. Luke, I used to walk to the castle like an idiot. You know, I didn't know Hollywood. I'm from Connecticut. I didn't realize, you know, at the gunshots, I thought it was cars backfiring. You know, there's gunshots going off down there. Oh, so I dressed my suit. I walked down the street. I live pretty close, like probably a quarter mile away, not even. That's not and I walked out to the castle. I laid at night, you know, 12, 30, 1 o'clock at night. I'm walking back to my studio apartment. Like, you know, I never do that now. Like, do, 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 do. yeah. <laughs> anyway. But those are the days of excitement, you know, of doing it and being fearless. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the history is there. Um, and then it's morphed into you taking on also um, the role of being a, a consultant in a big way, you know, as a producer and as a director, um, all kind of mixed in there. Yeah. You're doing a lot of stuff with TV now. Um, and over TV the years, you've, been, you've done it. But that's that's rad, too, yeah. man. Like it's fun. And people ask, like these young guys are cute. They say, Hey man, you know, uh, you know, how do I become a consultant? I want to be a consultant. I said, well, that's a good aspiration to have. Number one, I never turn anybody down, but I say, you don't really want to be. It's like, I only know what I know, not from reading it, but by actually physically doing it. Yeah. Like all the shows that I produced, you know, like almost 14 shows, you know, and casinos, I mean, these are full blown shows, not, you know, plus my act, of course, working with other people. And then that information, that knowledge comes into play naturally to consult. And that's how you actually become a consultant, a performer, creator, and director and producer. It's good tools to have, like real life experiences. I'm not smarter than anybody else. I just have more experiences than other people. That's well like to react. Well yeah. Said. Yeah. It's not about smarts. It's not about smarts. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad you touched on that because, um, you know, I've done a little bit of consulting, nothing compared to you, obviously. And that's always the thing people think it's just, you know, if you want to do it, you just do it, but you got to know what yeah. you're talking about <laughs> yeah. to, yeah. to help other creative. people, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I love what, Hey, I had the experience of seeing you working in action, you know, when you worked with Chris back in the day yep. and it's a great example. Like I love your energy you have like such a wonderful controlled energy and that's the way I like to work. A lot of guys are all over the place, which is fine. Yeah. That works for sure. them. But yeah. for me, I, most of my stuff that I create, and you're probably the same way is in silence. Yes. It comes to you. Yes. It clicks in like, Oh, like before you go to bed or if you're driving or yeah. that's what it is. So your style, I always like that. I, you were like the, uh, the anchor of the team, man. <laughs> Luke was like the man that really like anchored him down. It's like, okay, here's the guy. You controlled, the, you controlled the, the the energy levels. So it was good. It was very good. The the yin and the yang, it, right? The the yin and the yang. There you go. Yeah, 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 man. <laughs> um, and I admire it. Yeah, it's good. I, I want to let the guys know too. I know we're we're doing a lot of talking here too, but I want you guys to talk to us as well. So if you have questions for sure. Tony, uh, feel free to post them in the comments. I'm seeing everything you guys are uh, you know writing out there. So let me know in the comments if you have a question for him. Um, and nice. I'm more than happy to try to get it in here uh, tonight. We got a lot to talk about, so uh, okay. we'll do our best to get to you guys too. Um, the, the consulting, all this fun stuff. Yeah. And now, why don't we jump forward just a little bit here, and then yeah. we're going to get back into some of the the previous stuff. But I really want to talk about Fullest. This is hot. It's fresh. Yeah. You right. just did it. Um, yeah. Why don't you tell us about the experience? Kind of like the highlights, and, and maybe like what were some Wait, of your favorite right things about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well. First of all, people have to realize that I've been working on that routine for 30 years. It's oh, wow. evolved. Wow. Okay. Four years ago, I submitted a maybe well, almost five years ago now because the time's is crossing over the year. But I submitted it, the video four years ago. They didn't go for it. Okay. I submitted it. Then I skipped a year because I said, no, I got to change it up a little bit. Otherwise, it's not going to you know respond any better. <laughs> so then I changed it up. I skipped a year. So then I changed it up two years ago and I sent it to them. Don't, they didn't take it. So I'm like, okay. So uh, Stacey Cole and Danny Cole, good friends of mine, we did the castle one week. And you know, the castle is great because you do, you know, seven nights, two to three shows a night. 
so in that week we created some nice touches little pieces of touches that worked the act and made it better including music and styles cool. of vanishes and then i felt okay now i feel good i submit i shot the video at the castle i even posted it on my uh, youtube channel my audition video and they took it and that was it right. and when that happened and my head exploded like oh shoot this is coming you know it's, this is getting real it's real now <laughs> real yeah. right yeah so i said how am i gonna do this i have to be the best i can be i know tv you know tv it's very you don't know what's gonna happen you know you have to be reactive and yeah you know, be able to uh, not get things to throw you off balance when things happen tv changes constantly right oh yeah and that was the greatest thing i kept in my mind so i rehearsed I had to put my table that I used for the show in my room, bedroom, so I was able to walk by it every night, every day. I, I rehearsed probably over 300 times, maybe more, with just the full routine. And then separate, you know, the moves I separately practiced. So I really engulfed myself for over three months, like a gnat, like crazy. Enough that I was able to do the act with my eyes closed. Because cool. I said, you never know what's going to happen there. The light might be in my face. It might be a noise. You know, camera, you don't know. You know, I didn't know what the style was of that shot of that show. So long story short, I get there and they treat you great. You know, I love the great people. The producers are very kind. I met the, with Michael Close. We had a rehearsal, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Wednesday night, your shoot time. Perfect. Then Thursday, you shoot your opening video segment. All right. All right, cool. It's great. They separate it out. Nice. Get there Wednesday. I'm all ready to go down in the basement. They keep you locked away so you don't see any other acts. <laughs> I'm down there and all of a sudden, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. It's just getting late, you know. I've been down there for like four hours. The producer was really nice. Tony, I'm so sorry. We're running late. We have to bump you to tomorrow night, Thursday night. I said, okay, no problem, man. I get it. Goes, oh, by the way, we have to switch your video shoot to the morning now because we had you in the afternoon. So now your video shoot for the opening video, we, you, you, the producer's going to call you. Okay, good. They call me. So I have to get ready by 8 o'clock now in the morning. So I get up at 6.30, you know, get oh. ready for the shoot. It's a whole different ha head, you know, because I all, like, all the tricks <laughs> in my head for the opening, you know. My friend Alan uh, Abbott, thank God he came out. He helped me. And if it wasn't for him, it was going to be rough. So, okay, I get up. I do the shoot. I'm, I'm kind of – my hip's hurting. It's got, I had my hip replaced three months ago, by the way, my right hip. Oh, my God. Uh, so I'm looking around the casino. My friend Alan's carrying my stuff, helping me. And we do the shoot. We do the interview. Boom, done. I go upstairs. I got about an hour to get, have a, a quick bite to eat, take a shower, come back down now for the TV show. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying to myself, I'm glad I'm ready because I, I, this would fluster me otherwise. You know, I'm, I'm rushing now. So mm -hmm. I go downstairs, everything's already there. And now here we go, right? Michael Close comes to me and says, you know, gives me the rules about how to you know, react and what, you know, what to say, what not to say on camera. I got it, got it, got it. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Go upstairs. I'm ready to go. I'm looking through the crack. I see Penitella walk into their seats. Allison's over there in the corner. I'm like, all right, here we go. And all of a sudden I hear, okay, we need the security medic. We need a medic. Like, what? Medic, security, medic. What the oh, hell? No. The walls go up. The back door of the theater goes up. It's raining. It never rains in Vegas, right? It's raining. And there's a guy in the front left corner of the house in the audience having an epileptic seizure. Oh, no. Oh, so I'm like, God. oh, my God. I mean, I was ready to be introduced. I was like a minute away, right? Oh. So long story short, the, the medics came. They took care of him. He was recovered. They took him out so he could recover outside. So now we start. <laughs> we all go back to our spots. 45 minutes go by. And the producers go, are you okay, Tony? We're so sorry. No, we bumped you. Now this happened. I said, look, I'm cool, man. I'm cool. <laughs> so in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm glad I'm prepared. Finally get out there. Boom. They introduced me and I felt so relaxed and comfortable. I'm like, oh, here we are after all this time, man. You know how it is, cool. you perform. It's like that feeling of like, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and Penn and Teller were cool. And um, you don't meet them. That's against the rules. You can't meet them before, obviously. And after, uh, they get you out of there quick, especially if you win, they want you out. Got it. So I do the routine. And here's the thing it was a combination of reiterating the story with Slidini just a few hours earlier, right? Think about it. I did the opening video where I talk about Slidini oh, yeah. and more detail because they only show snippets of it for the opening video. And I forgot to mention that. I did a video about that, telling people why I got emotional. I'm like, that's what it was. I had that in my head from doing the opening video inter uh, interview earlier that day, and it's in my mind, and it's still there. Now this happens, and then I win. It was like, 
Woof. it was like an, yeah it was like a big like wow man you know pretty cool so that's that's how it went down and then teller came over to me after and said you know it was really great it was really nice to him he walked over and I was, you know, he didn't have to um so they gave me the award backstage it was wrapped up they said okay go to your car and i'm done good can't talk about it i said okay so i had to not talk about it for eight months oh, eight, eight months, months. <laughs> yeah eight months man it's crazy oh, that's a lot but it was a great experience everybody was, it was professional if people don't know tv they would have said wow well, i was waiting around a long time and they had us in the oh, basement yeah. it's like <laughs> that's normal that's that's to me didn't phase me at all oh they changed my date you know my times and this and that <laughs> to me it didn't phase me at all that's just from experience, knowing it's going to change. It's going to change. You know, the or, pro. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, was, it was a great experience. It was really a wonderful experience. And I was there basically the 12th we shot. And the 13th is when they started shutting down Las Vegas. <laughs> so, oh, my God. As I'm driving out of Vegas, the doors are literally closing behind me. <laughs> so, Talking about cutting I close, man. Like, Jeez. Yeah, that was close. Wow, wow, wow. And uh, do you, is the trophy nearby? Do you have the trophy, or have you not gotten oh, it yet? Oh, the trophy! Oh, I put it in the other room. Shoot. That's okay. Hold on, okay. Somebody bring me the trophy. <laughs> the trophy. Luke, my son Luke. Yeah. Can you bring my trophy <laughs> to my room? But Dad, you have a lot of trophies. Which one? Luke Dancy. My son's Luke too. You know that? I told you my son's name. Yeah. Is Luke. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I like he's Luke's. Like, he's like, which, which, which trophy, Dad? You have so many awards. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Clark, the man of many awards. <laughs> Thanks, man. My, my Luke's son brought it to me. There it is. Hey, there it is. Nice. Yeah. What a beauty. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's, it's like a, kind of weird to hold it, you know? It's like you see it on TV and they go, oh, man, this is like cool. That's so, awesome. That that actually would have been funny if, if I asked for it and it like it came down behind you. <laughs> oh, that, oh, we should have that out. I could have done it. I, I could have put it on a bar up there. I could have done it. This old thing? <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I gotta keep that in mind, by the way. That's like actually a funny gag. See how creative you are? That's what I love, man. There you go. We, it, we never turn it off, man. You know, you know how it is. You never turn it off. Yeah. That's true, right? Because uh-huh. I'm working on a little project with somebody right now, and you know, he says, you know, here's the budget. I said, look, whatever you pay me, it's never enough. I'm not being rude, but I I think about this all the time i couldn't charge you 20 hours a day before i go to bed you know the same way you got an idea in your head you got to figure it out especially when the ideas are not complete like i'm working on this one thing ah, I can't get it, <laughs> it right. lingers and lingers it lingers yeah. and you never stop i said so you never pay me by the hour say so it's just i'm just doing it for for fun you know so <laughs> that's that uh daniel daniel ricks is digging on the um the background there he's digging on the big giant card behind you that is pretty oh, cool okay. i gotta say that yeah yeah it's, cool. it's five by ten it's a big ass wow. card <laughs> um so we're talking about fullest i've got a I got a hell of a segue here for you um Go. my question to you tony clark yeah which one do you think and i know you're a pro so don't get me wrong i, I know stage fright eh, not yeah. really a thing for you um but well, a little bit yeah going on tv uh, or, yeah. you know, having all these cameras on you and having yeah. Penn and Tiller sitting there watching you. Uh, yeah. Could kind of, you know, which one was scarier? Having them do that and going through that experience or this, Tony Clark? The car escape of death. <laughs> <laughs> Little throwback uh, here. That was scary. That I didn't, I lost a lot of sleep before and actually more afterwards. Okay. Because when the editor called me and said, Tony, I, I had six cameras on this shoot. I oh, spent, wow. this is about almost, I don't know, almost 20 years ago, 18 years ago. I spent six grand on this shoot just because I wanted to get it right. I have cameras everywhere because I said, you know what? This got to be caught on camera. So I had a, a guy that I met. He was from a TV station and he was a great camera guy. He got a crew together. But the problem was, that day we were rehearsing in the morning, it was very windy. See that box going on top right now? Yep. I It's just it's butcher paper, right? So I punch out of it, but I double it up. And I didn't realize you double up butcher paper, it's harder to break through. Oh. Right? Wow. Like here to bang. Look, look how close it is. I didn't even land and the car went through me. Wow. It went right by me, right? So what happened was, Luke, I was in there, right? I'm ready to go. I'm ready to escape. Look, bah! The car is there, and I'm not even out of the box yet. 
I'm in the fire. Look at that. Wow. I and mean, that's close. Wow. And it wasn't supposed to be that close. Because here I am waiting for my I know when to go, right? I go to hit the paper and it didn't break through. I'm like, oh shit. I forgot to perforate it with the oh. razor blade. And I had two layers instead of one because the wind, I didn't want the wind to blow off the oh, first yeah, layer sure. to blow me up. So I'm down low. And when I jump, I never expected to be off the ground, but I was like panic mode. I literally exploded on that box and my head slid up. And if you notice, it rips across the top edge. It's, it was supposed to rip through the middle. But by the fact of it raising me up, my head caught a little bit of the wood on the top. Okay. going through and it got me off the ground and you'll see it when it comes out watch and it, it was this, and i didn't know every all this until after i mean that car also was an issue look at watch this i mean from that angle it got look it's coming i'm still in there see how it's not oh ripping? my god it didn't rip it ripped across the top so my guy called you tony you got to come in i gotta show you this you were really close said, oh thanks no 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 you got to come in here a tenth of a second. Look. Wow. A tenth of a second, I would have been nailed by the car. Oh, my God. It was because of that paper not freaking ripping. Dude, that's crazy. That reminds me of when Lance did the um, the roller coaster, and he almost got his freaking legs chopped off from the – remember yeah. that one? Where yeah. He's Good God. Yeah, because those are just variables that happen on – you know, <laughs> like you know, there's variables on TV shoots. And what is dangerous – I mean, I rehearsed that for – God months also but the car i never checked the brakes the steering it was an old clunker i bought that car for like 500 bucks <laughs> and i liked it because the piston was knocking so it sounded really cool like a like a train coming <laughs> <laughs> so i added some drama to the car because i couldn't get big, big pipes on it i wanted it so it was like tup, 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 tup. i had an mc that worked the show to you know get the audience going that was a big help um, but that was very scary. After I saw how close I was, I started having nightmares of not getting out. Whoa. That affected me for like whew, months and months after. And I still to this day now, when I see it, I haven't watched that video in a long time. I get that feeling like, oh man, I'm not getting out. It's like, Jesus. So don't try that at home, everybody. Do not try that at home. And I'm glad you mentioned, uh, you know, the things can go wrong, obviously, and, and all that, yeah. because people see escapes, especially as magicians. You know, and this yeah. is a magician's crowd, so I'm, I'm okay saying some of this stuff. Um, yeah. You know, they, they know about some of the equipment that you can use that kind of like right. fail safes, you know? Sure. Uh, and they just think automatically, oh, they just do escapes. Eh, it's just a, but there's always something that could go right. Yeah. And just as you said here, even something as small as just the paper. The paper. <laughs> the paper was killed. It was the headline. Butcher paper kills the magician. You know, oh, <laughs> because of the butcher paper, he got killed. You know, uh, and then it was uh, yeah. It's it's true, and I did have fail safes. I mean, I had fail safes up to the until the second the car started going. <laughs> so, okay. but after that, I thought I was good, and nope, it did not happen. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but well, thankfully, it looked good. And that show, the reason why I did that, Luke, was first uh, of all, I think it was my one thousandth anniversary show. Okay, it was two years into my run in Tahoe. And then I also wanted to submit it to Gary Willette, who produced the world's greatest magic and right. the world's most dangerous magic. And I'm like, I'm in Tahoe. I got this awesome show and I'm not getting on TV. This is crazy. So I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this right. I want to get out of the world's greatest, uh, world's most dangerous magic. I sent the video. He calls me immediately. Gary Willette calls me immediately. Like, Tony, when could you come in town? We're going to talk about this. They love it. I'm like, oh, cool. There you go, man. There you but go. But again, it's an example of when you really do it. You know what I mean? I, I, oh, the time and the effort, and it's not about the money, it's about just, uh, just really uh, engaging it and, and really committing yourself, man. It's just, you can't, you can't fake that. It just stuff happens. You know, people feel that energy as well. If you talk about something, people are like, ah, oh, you're talking, you know, a lot of talkers around. When you physically do it, and you know, I have my team with me and my guys, you know, and then here's how, here's how scary it was. I was trying to get a stock car racer from Reno, which is down the hill from Tahoe. I mm -hmm. found out about this guy to drive the car. I, did, I said, I need a professional driver. So he calls me. <laughs> I describe him what to do. He goes, no, I'm not available. He didn't want to drive. He didn't want to be responsible. So I had to talk to my stage guy, John Cohen, God bless him, to drive the car. And he was scared, man. So what did I do? I gave him a helmet. I had a fire department. I had a full-blown fire department. I had paramedics. I, I did. I mean, you know, you got to have all that stuff, right? 
and I put two bars on the windshields, you know, uh, to just you see the two white bars on the windshield there, just oh, in yeah. case uh, the wood would penetrate through. And I had somebody paint the side, you know. And you know what was more expensive? That bumper was more expensive than the car. <laughs> Are you <So> serious? <laughs> I had some guy you see out here in LA make those spikes for me, and and those spikes were all aluminum and you know with tips on them. Like, I think I spent uh, almost 350, 400 bucks just on the spikes. <laughs> not to mention all the other materials, and the car was like 500 bucks. So That's you know funny, the spikes man. were more expensive. But it, it had a great touch, man. We had that car outside, and people were looking at that car with the sign on it. We had thousands of people all the way around. That's a casino next on the other side. People here, people up top, people on the street, and nobody behind me. They wanted people. I said, no, nobody can be behind me. That car, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Like yeah. I said, I never made sure, I never checked the brakes of the car. <laughs> oh, there's but, the thing. Oh, my God. I didn't even see them the first time. You were right. The, I didn't see that until the spikes. Yeah, there they are on the – oh, my God. They're wanna... huge. Yeah, they were like uh, maybe – 24 inches. Oh my God, dude. Yeah. See that? So when I had that in the street with a sign on it, people were like, what the hell is that? Wow. Yeah. See, yeah that's pretty crazy. crazy. Good looking dude. Wow. Yeah. Had a mounted <laughs> to the bumper. I mean, oh my God. It was like, what a job. <laughs> but, you know, and I rehearsed with the car going, you know, on the side of me for timing, you know, boom, boom. I had a rehearse getting out of the straight jacket, the chains, oh, yeah. all the other work inside I had to deal with, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of work, man. It was, but it paid off the fact that I got on an NBC show. You know, it was uh, most interesting. Yeah, it paid off. Yeah, not to mention, you know, as a uh, you know escape artist or you know as an illusionist as you as you sure. were here, uh, you also yeah. have the uh, the the really nice advantage uh, that close up guys don't have of being surrounded by beautiful women. Uh, well, <laughs> that doesn't hurt. You know, um, see, that was the formula back then. We were in a casino. Those were the shows. You know, we had a cabaret show. We had an adult show in the after. And the, uh, the second show was an adult show. It's topless. Not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen anymore. You don't see that happen anymore. But mm -hmm. they, these dancers were top notch, man. These were like the best dancers we could find. You know, it was really we had a we had pick of the litter because we had people, girls coming up from Reno, local girls in town. We, we found the best, you know, we found the best dancers we could have in the show. Uh, and yeah, it was a great experience, man. It was a great experience. How long did your show run there? That show ran for four years, which was never done before. And it, it never, it was a record. It was a hist, uh, history of uh, entertainment record there because the shows always turned over every year or less. Not one, it, the show having the same performer for four years, never, it never happened. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, so it was it's... great. And when I opened that show, I had, uh, I think. Which I have in my pocket. I think I had five hundred dollars left in my account. Oh wow! And I had to pay the dancers, the crew, the backstage crew. Because it was a four. Was, that was a loop. That was probably the last of the original legitimate four walls. Oh wow! Four wall is when the performer goes in, he pays for all the show expenses, and the casino gives them the waiters, and they take the drinks. That's how it worked. And they just like people coming in. Right. That was a, the four wall. So I had to pay for my advertising. Once in a while, they would kick some in, but. My advertising, the girls, my backstage guy, my technical guy. Wow. So I'm going, oh man, I gotta make, I gotta break even this week. I, I gotta sell enough tickets to pay my crew and cast. I don't care if I get paid. Wow. So I went out with coupons. I made coupons, and I went to all the hotels and motels myself. And I'm tired from rehearsing and yeah, handing man. out coupons and giving people at the hotels and motels. And they were like, "You're the star of the show." I said, "Yeah, I'm the star of the producer." Oh my god, that's cool. He do it all. But that saved my butt. That saved my my first week. I was able to make, I think. I don't know, hundred bucks profit, but paying everybody off was great. I paid the whole cast and crew. I was like, oh, thank God. And then it kept getting better and better and better and better. And the rest, as they say, is history. Wow. Uh, someone actually asked a question too. I know that one of the, the feature things that you would do uh, during that show, which is where it became legendary, uh, was your dove act. Uh, yeah. You know, that really became legendary from there. Someone was asking, I'm trying to go through the comments here. There's a lot of them. Uh, someone's asking if you still have you kept the doves. Do you do you keep any doves uh, these days? They were old, man. I had those birds. Majority of those birds were with me since I came to LA at that point. Okay, and they wow. were 20, 20 years old. And then I didn't. I haven't done that act in over ten years. Okay, I don't have birds anymore. I gave them to, to Joel Ward. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. Joel Ward has them, and I don't know if he still has them. They probably passed away by now. They're so old. But you mm -hmm. know, we used to trade birds off and stuff. So if I need a bird for a trick or for a show, we, I, you know, we trade off birds. There you go. Well, yeah. uh, it, it's it's fun to me, and I'm not I'm not saying what I'm about to say just to be nice, Tony. Um, 
uh, speaking of doves, you know, the birds, uh, we just had one legend um, leave Las Vegas, you know, and I, you know, I, I've always put you uh, in the same world, you know, is the Lance Burtons out there because you're a legend in your own right. And I don't want to hear anything else. You're just, you're a damn legend. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting that the Dove Acts um, is prevalent as they were, like as popular as they were, do you think that we're going to continue to see that? Or do you think that with animal rights and people becoming more sensitive uh, yeah. and even the travel restrictions, actually, they were starting to happen. Do you think we're still going to see Dove Acts or those type of acts in general, you know, with... It's, you know, yeah, it, it, it's down a lot. Yeah. As I could tell by you know, my products that I would sell were doves, which I don't really sell dove products anymore. Got it. It's changed for everything you said. Look at, you know, it, when, when Ringling Brothers couldn't do, got rid of their uh, tigers and lions and then they got their elephants, then you know it was done. You know, it was done. And people, I don't think people like to see them on stage as much as they used to. Um, animal mm -hmm. rights people and all that. And, uh, but I don't know. I think it was a, it may come back someday, but I think it was the golden years are done with that for me mm -hmm. anyway. Okay. Uh, and, you know, uh, and I was glad to be part of, a small part of it. You know, Lance was the king, obviously, and Shimada before him, and then Channing Pollock before that. You know, uh, but it was definitely uh, a, a great time to do it. I used to travel with those birds <laughs> in a duffel bag. Oh, my and God. I put them in the and I put them, in, I put them in, my, uh, in my, under my uh, seat in front of me. Oh, my God. That's how easy it was back in the day. Think about it. Now you could you can't get through with a piece of the water that's over three ounces. You know, True so, that. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's definitely changed a lot. I think uh, I got lucky uh, when I did travel. It was so easy, you know, so yeah. easy. The uh, um and and if you guys don't know, I know a lot of people have have done this over the years. Just one thing from Tony Clark that's very popular is the the mask to dove the the instant yeah. thing. I, I know Chris Angel does that during his bird act yeah. uh, here in Vegas. As per yeah, your, yeah. you know, you consulted on that, obviously. So, yeah, that was a, a theme that I came up with with my mentor uh, Bill Andrews. After I went uh, with Slidenia, I met my friend Bill Andrews, and he mentioned go see the Phantom of the Opera in New York. Because I lived in Connecticut, so I went to New York every week. Anyway, I said okay. So I went there, couldn't get tickets. My friend goes, you know, look for scalpers, man. You'll find a scalper, you know. So okay, I'll I'll spend two hundred dollars for a ticket that cost a hundred bucks back then, whatever. So I'm looking, and this guy goes, hey, you want tickets? And then all of a sudden, it came up, the guy took off. The guy behind me goes, hey, man, don't buy scalp tickets. You can get arrested. I'm like, okay, get in that cancellation line. You have better luck over there. I'm like, oh, cancellation line. I didn't know about that. I get in line. Long story short, I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. A lady comes with eight tickets to return because people didn't make it in from their wherever they're flying in from. And I happen to be in that number eight. Hmm. Seventh row center at watching the Phantom of the Opera with uh, Michael Crawford in broad on Broadway. That's cool. Unbelievable. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> I, I've seen, seen the one, film? I saw the one that was in Vegas. I did see oh, that cool. one. Um, that was I good. know it's not I the same, that. but it was pretty cool. No, I, I like the one in Vegas too, but it was a magical. So anyway, long story short, the theme, uh, my, my mentor says, if you could capture a little bit of that theme, you know, back then theme acts were kind of in. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put the, I'll start with the mask just to give it a little taste of that feeling. And I had an archway made and stuff and silk painted and all that. And, uh, but that's how it started. It was uh, from watching the Phantom of the Opera. Because for me, that show was more magical than some magic shows you see. You know, the way mm -hmm. stuff happens in that show is pretty incredible. There's the moment. Uh, Here comes the bam. Here's the bam, the first one, yeah. Ah, so beautiful. So beautiful, yeah. man. Love that. Yeah. Love that. Love yeah. That. Thanks, um, buddy. Someone wanted to know, Thomas Bradley over on Facebook, wanted to know, how long have you done magic, Mr. Tony Clark? It's uh, That's Whoa. a tough question. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been, uh, Jesus. A little bit. It's been uh, since I was six years old, so oh. it's well over 40 years. Nice. Very yeah. cool. Believe it or not, yeah. Um, most memorable moment with Slidini, that comes from Ralph over on YouTube. And I'm excited to hear the answer to this one too. Your most memorable, most memorable with, moment? Yeah, most wow. memorable with the master. It's interesting. He was a very quiet man. That was just his nature. Very quiet, soft-spoken, 
not a man of many words. When he spoke, though, you pay attention. You know, it was like, oh, he's saying something. Shut up and listen, right? Uh, so when he looked at me about, I was into, I was doing lessons. I was there about two months, and I was really into it. He saw my progress. He commented. He said, you know, he said you're a very good student. You're an excellent student. He says someday I think you could work at the Magic Castle. Whoa, giving me confidence that I can work at the Magic Castle. Like, wow, that's pretty crazy. Then he says, he says, but you have a nice face, but you're too big. And imagine, I was at that point, I was about 220. Is this from the lifting? Big, yeah, from powerlifting. Yep. yep. Yeah. Uh, and he was a small man. He was probably five foot two and three oh, no. and very oh. slight. So imagine me being, and he, you know, he, and I'm like <laughs> overpowering. You know, he, we used to work across the table like this. He'd be literally right there and I'd be right here. And he said that to me. He said, oh my God, this guy gave me confidence, but I got, I got something to do here. I got to change my life. And that was it. That I'll never forget that to this day. I still remember those words, the way he talked to me, and the way it hit me so hard that he was so sincere with it, you know. And he never talked about personal things, really. But that was like, wow, powerful moment. Yeah, it's life changing. Cool. And obviously, we're watching right now one of the classic pieces, you know. No oh yeah, or, man. You know, I love doing this piece. Oh god, it had some great lines, you know. Uh, the girls would come out, dance around the guy. Uh, and they would cue him to walk off with them, right? That's always a funny gag. So I grab him back. <laughs> and then one night I'm like this, and he's like looking out in the audience like this. I'm like, uh oh, who's that? Just my wife. People laugh. I said, oh. And I said, don't worry. All those girls are married to me. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I did that line off the cuff. Great. And he got a few laugh. And then by accident, you know, like, you know, some things happen just by, you know, good accident, happy accident. And then I kept that line forever. But this routine, I love this routine, man. This was a great routine. But the best part of this routine was what followed afterwards, which was a do as I do handkerchief gag that I do. Mm -hmm. And he, it look, I make him look like he fools me. And the audience loves it. Retribution, right? And it's like that segment, I love this segment in the show. I've always loved it, you know, it's just, just great. It's a fun piece, you know, it's pure misdirection. Yeah, it's, it's like yeah, it's fighting 101, you know, and, and I always tell people, you know, they do it wrong. You know, never do this action. You know, people do this action. You just, it's always here. It's never a move. You know, it's not this. So anyway, but that, I love that piece. That was a great piece. Yeah. Yeah. And you've definitely have, have kept it alive. I know there's some literature out there from you on the uh, paper balls over the head. So you guys should definitely yeah, check yeah. it out. Yeah. Paper balls over the head. The, uh, I was going to redo the video and then we didn't now because of all this stuff, but oh, yeah. it's time. I did that video 25 years ago. Oh my God. 25 years. Really? Murphy's was the first one to carry it for me. Murphy's magic. Man, that's crazy. Where does oh, time back go? then it was a, a one multimedia. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. Back in the day. God. Back wow. in the day, man. That's before you were born. <laughs> Uh, speaking of going back in the day, uh, why don't we yes. look at the future? Someone's got a great question for you. Uh, All right. Leo, uh, where do you see the future of magic in the next 10 to 30 years? I know that's a big gap, Whoa. <laughs> but maybe we just look at the next 10 years to well, start. My future, I hope I'll be on a farm like Lance. No that's kidding. My future for yeah. 30 years, you know, Lance Burton. Yeah. It's such a great story. Yeah. Um, I think magic is definitely changing right now because of what we're dealing with right yeah. the virtual that's why i built this thing i have a little studio now i built you know it's kind of messy it's not like crap over but i do my virtual shows here um so definitely that's changed things but i do miss i am starving for the live audience yeah that's why i got into it that's the energy you want that's why you entertain people is that energy and virtually it doesn't happen that way, unfortunately. You know, it's fine, but for now, I just call it a placeholder for now. But some guys are doing really well with it, doing you know, making tons of money. But for me, I never did magic for the money. Really, I, I did it because I loved it. Mm -hmm. But I think in ten years, I think it's going to still progress. I think in, I see a resurgence of classical magic coming back. Cool. Because I think it peaks. You know, I call it the fat tie, skinny tie. You know, the ties start off fat, then they get skinny. Oh, yeah. you know? How skinny can they go? Oh, you, oh, you do the rope. You know, I guess this, the, the bolero ties the ropes, and then it starts going fat again. So with magic, I think people are going to want to see live entertainment more than ever when this is all over. 
I think it's going to boom. And I think people will appreciate the classics better. Not better, but I think they'll have a place, a, a more a prominent place of magic. I think the classics will come back. All right. That would be nice, you know. I think that the generation of magicians that we have now, because as you know, it's kind of like a revolving door, and then there's your core people. Yeah. Um, there's a generation of magicians that have no idea about the classics that I think they would right. absolutely love them, and they should know about them so that they, so that they live on too. You know, the classics. Yeah, ones, yeah, definitely. It's 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 a base. You know, it's like a base. Is you know, you're building something. Have a strong base. Yeah. Um, and even watching the classical performers, you can't really perform like them right now because the tempo, but you still learn a lot, you know, from watching the classic guys and how they handle the audience and the stage presence, you know, Chenny Pollock, you know, he had such a great stage presence and, uh, I was able to spend time with him years ago and in, in his house in Santa Cruz. And he shared some really amazing stuff about how he accomplished this stuff on stage, you know, other than he was a really good looking guy. Six foot four, whatever you know, natural. You know, it's natural. You know, it's like Lance. This every every certain amount of years, a guy comes around. You know, and it's like that guy. So Channing was the man. Channing was the man. So yeah. If you guys have never yeah. seen Channing Pollock, look him up on YouTube. Uh, definitely oh yeah. See some of his his stuff. He was it's, he was the man. Yeah. Yeah. He, he had that. He created that style, man. Really cool. Yeah. But it's good to learn. I mean, you learn from people's styles. You know. Uh, uh, well, Fred Caps is a great guy to watch too. I oh, tell yeah. young guys watch Fred Caps, his misdirection. Oh my lord, beautiful stuff. Very well versed too. Fred Caps was like very well versed in all stuff, all types of magic. So yeah, it's been a lot of greats. You know, Fred Caps then into Tommy Wonder and on and on. Yeah, it's been a lot of greats. Yeah, yeah, a lot of greats. Um, yeah. What about your favorite trick of Slidini? Uh, our friend over on Facebook here would like to know. Do you have a favorite? Uh, most favorite trick of his maybe that you got to watch or that you love watching him do for people maybe even i, I love watching him do uh, the cigarettes back oh, in the cool. day when you do cigarettes the torner store cigarettes and the you know the burning cigarette and he gets in you know it just so you know gets in the guy's face and he's just you know it's just and he melts it together and comes back it's amazing yeah. the it's the amazing. pacing just the the flow i always think of that yeah. when I think of Slidini, it just all seems so well yeah, choreographed, choreographed, just well done. Yeah, yeah. it was just yeah. it was magic. Yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't fast paced. I think there's a place for it, but I tend not to like the overly fast paced stuff. Yeah. Uh, so it was the pacing. Now that pacing would be a little slow. So you yeah. got to kind of find a happy medium, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely certain things you can't rush though. Timing and misdirection, and you know. Uh, offbeat principles you can't rush them they have to have a, a natural flow of your body that's why misdirection and body motion works that's the body the most valuable thing i learned from slidini is, is the body takes your hands there right like if i have to grab something from my lap i don't do this i lean forward and grab something and the body just happens to do what you needed to do but that only happens when you move naturally so if you move quick that's when the audience goes beep, 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 great arrows go off. Mm -hmm. Something happened, you know, it's like the stiff hand, right? You're palming a card and you know, where people look, they look at tension. You know, I always say tension creates attention. Well, That's like teach my students. Tension creates attention. When it's dead, it goes over their head. When the hand's dead, it goes over their head. So those are like little things I talk about when people ask me about what's the strongest tools. That's it. Very nice. Um, Looking through a few more of the comments here. Uh, Chris Cram, a nice bit of love for you in here too. He says he's ready for the classics, linking rings, cups, and the salt pour by Tony Clark. He's a big fan of your salt oh, pour. That's a, oh, I love that trick too, man. I, I, I developed that, my own version of that over the uh, last, like, I don't know, seven, six, seven years. Cool. And I do um, this pasta trick. Oh my God, I can't forget his name now. Um, it's, a, it's a pasta, break, store, torner store pasta trick. Oh, Chen Long. Yeah, Chen Long. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. And I go, oh my God, this will go great for my Italian segment. Because I talk about being Italian and then I eat pasta one, two, three times a day. Uh, and, you know, I go into a routine and I said, I'm going to show you a trick I created because I was around pasta all the time. And I do that trick. Boom. And then I go, oh, you know what? Let's use a little salt. I have a bowl of pasta. And then I get into the salt pour. <laughs> it, it, all, it was like perfect. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I need that for my shows for the virtual <laughs> show. 
<laughs> I need you. On, I need you to be my tech or talk about it later. I'm serious, by the way. I guess. Um, but uh, the salt pour is a fun trick, and I use a funny piece of music that I came up with, and just people the audience sings along with me, and it's 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 fun. It's fun. Sounds like Chris Cram uses it in com combination with his egg bags. That's how he's using his in combo with. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah so, man, it's a great place to definitely. I mean, anything that you could like have it as an ending to something else, it's great. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, uh, Ted J Ted Danger. I like his last name, Ted Danger. Um, Ooh, I should ever hang out with. <laughs> wait, wait, what was that? What was that? I like that name. I should have had that when I was doing the uh, the, the box trick, the box uh, escape. <laughs> Tony, Tony Danger. Danger. I love it. <laughs> uh, well, hey, we'll never forget that guy's name, right? It's true, actually. It's very true. Well, I'll never forget Ted Danger's name. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you ever hang out with Joseph Gabriel? That was what he, uh, that's what Mr. Danger wanted to know. All right. Joseph Gabriel, we, I had the pleasure and I loved his show when I first saw it at the City Lights when it was at the Flamingo, man. It was so good. Power, different style than Lance, you know, just pounded you, bam, bam, bam. I loved it. I had the pleasure of producing a show with, uh, and I hired him and Catalin, his wife at the time, beautiful girl. They worked beautifully together. And we worked together at the uh, Riverside Casino in Laughlin. And uh, we were, it was about, I think it was a three month run there. So I got to know him really well. And smart guy, talented guy, he's an actual artist, like, you know, drawing artist in addition to his magic. He does puppeteering as well as magic. He was great, great smart guy. And I love talking to the guys that work those club, you know, the, the casinos, the, the work. They have great stories, great experiences. So yes, uh, Joseph Gabriel, I, I love him. He's a great, great guy. Cool, all right. Um, just look through some comments here uh, and any, any questions. Uh, we'll start to wrap this up in just a minute. So if there were any other things that I haven't mentioned, and of course, again, if you guys are just joining us, um, here's the moment. Uh, you can check it out on, on YouTube. Go to Tony's YouTube channel and watch it where he actually managed to fool uh, Penn and Teller. He was on this season yep. of Fullest. So uh, again, a big congrats to him for that. The big Thank moment. You, there you. it is. And of course, behind him, if you're just joining us, he actually has the... Uh, almost hit me in the head, that thing. <laughs> I see. No, it's way back. It looks close, but it's like... By four, five feet, five feet back. Ooh. Imagine that. <laughs> if I move back, <laughs> with this, this, imagine it'd be like a harpoon. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> it's it pretty is. dangerous, man. It's, it's like a star or whatever that is. The big fu. I love that. The, yeah. the fu. Fu, man. Perfect. <laughs> so good. Um, I will ask you one last question. This one's for me. Um, I always like to try to get inside the heads of people that have been there and done that. Um, for okay. people that are looking to do magic in a similar way that you've done it, which is to make it a career over the years, do you have any generic advice? As my hat's fallen off. Um, do you have any generic advice for people or just a general blanket statement for people that Right. want to make magic their life. And I know things are weird now. I get it. It's a yeah. weird time. Yeah. Um, right. But it's not going to stay like this forever, you know? So um, maybe some wise words from Mr. Tony Clark about making magic your life when it comes to that as an artist, the life of an artist, you know? Well, I think there's just two ways to do it, okay? You could do it like risking everything and moving 3,000 miles away like I did it and living in an apartment, a studio apartment and living on you know, barely any money and food and, and, you know, muscling through, or there's another way you could do it. And I, this is fine too. get the best of both worlds. If you need to sustain yourself and have some kind of job and still be able to do magic. Now it's a win win, right? Magic can still be your life. It doesn't matter, but don't let it become overly stressful. And then it takes away from the enjoyment that you're doing magic. Well, so it's kind of a balance. But what, the way I did it, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> uh, it was tough. Did pay a price on certain things in my life and relationships, and uh, it, it wasn't easy. Um, and uh, but if you really want it, you will find the answers to make it work. You know what I mean? Uh, when I was here and I was almost down to three hundred bucks in my uh, account and my rent was coming up, and it was like four hundred bucks for the rent. 
I took a job working with Drexel Burnham and Lampart serving food in a building. Nobody ever knew about that. And right in Beverly Hills, it was a stockbroker's building. My neighbor was used to do it. He was an actor. He said, hey, man, if you need money, come down. You start at nine, you end by one or two and get to f- take food home. Wait. Beautiful. <laughs> that got me through uh, six months of maybe starving and having to leave, going back to Connecticut. I made, made it through it. Then I got booked at the, the body shop. And, you know, and, and but then it still wasn't easy, but that's the key is if you love something, you'll do it. Don't do magic because you want to be professional or, or, or I mean, if you want to be professional if, for the money or you want this giant fame because mm-hmm. that's the end result. People don't focus on the end. We all want to get to the end. Focus on how you to get there, right? Have the plan in place and, and nail it and be flexible because sometimes that plan does change a little bit, you know? So have a plan and do something. Passion, I say, is physical. Passion is not talking. Passion is physical. So do what you got to do to get to that next level and work towards it. And maybe you work part-time and maybe you work less hours and maybe about, and, and slowly, now it's full-time and you do it full-time. But still love it and do it. You know, do magic because you love it. Yeah. People see that when you do it. They really do. They can tell. Well said. Very well said. And that's one reason I really wanted to ask you that, knowing you, you know, and, and your history. Um, these days, as you know, a lot of the, the the younger generation, they want it quick. They want it real right. quick. And I know we have a, yeah. a age range of people ranging from young to older that are, you know, right. but it's it's always good to hear the reality of stuff. And like you said, I mean, you just have to do it, but be ready for whatever happens. You know, it's not going to be yeah. a, it's not always going to be a fun, smooth ride, but that's part of the no. the fun later is to tell those stories. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, in a weird way, that should jazz you to get keep you going, you know? That energy should be like, it needs to get you like going uh, as opposed to you know, making you shy away from it. So that excitement and the insecurity and the, you know, not knowing was very exciting, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I would do it now, you know, but back then it was perfect. Sure. <laughs> that's what yeah. being younger. <laughs> Um, if people would like to keep up with you after this, uh, yeah. website, social media, wherever it is, if people want to learn more, just see more of you uh, in the online space, plug, plug, and plug away, yeah. Mr. Tony Clark. To my YouTube channel, uh, you know, on YouTube, obviously. Where else would it be? <laughs> YouTube <laughs> channel, Instagram, Tony Clark Magic Instagram. Uh, and those are the two main ones that I focus on. And I put uh, products out. I do new videos kind of get you and keep you in kind of touch what's happening in my little, little world. And I will say, uh, and I mentioned this at the top and I, I totally forgot about it. So we've had so much to talk about. Um, my favorite version of the gypsy thread belongs to Tony Clark. It oh, uses thanks. a balloon and yeah. it makes so it's much true. sense. So if you guys yeah. haven't seen that yet, go look it up, uh, on yeah. the YouTubes or on his website. What's it called again? I don't remember the exact name. Gypsy balloon, the gypsy balloon. I should have known. Duh. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's like the uh, it's like the Reese's peanut butter cup commercial. The uh, the, the the balloon and the uh, gypsy thread had a oh yeah, a lot of collision. <laughs> and it literally happened that way. That's how we got created. So it is amazing, guys. I know a lot of you do it already, but if you haven't seen it, you need to because it is a brilliant piece of magic. One of my favorites. And it makes so much sense. It just makes a lot of sense. So for what it's worth, check out the Gypsy Balloon. Now I remember the name because he told me. So, Uh, And check him out. Please do. Tony is a pro. He's out there. And if you guys ever need any consulting as well, um, I know that Tony, I don't know how booked you are right now. You might not have uh, an open schedule for it, but Tony does a lot of consulting too. So I I did want to give you a mention on that. um, Thank you. It's easier. Actually, it's easier now. We do it all virtually now. It's actually easier. So me traveling around. Are you traveling? People saving thousands of dollars, not having to travel. So yeah. I do lessons all over the world. And Tony doesn't just do it for small thing. He does it for like legit TVs, movies. Oh, yeah. Like he's plugged oh, yeah. into the world of consulting in a big yeah. way. So yeah. yeah. All right, my all friend. Right. Well, uh, Tony, thank you so much for the time tonight. Again, congratulations on pulling Pin and Teller. It's no small feat. Thank so you, man. That's, that's all that. It's a hey, big deal. Best part of it is. I get to spend time with you, buddy. Hey, hey, all right. I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. And, and you guys too. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. And was a yeah, later so out there. So thanks for the questions, hanging out. And it's good to see you guys. And I see my friend BT out there. 
Uh, I want to give him some love. VT, I'll answer your email tomorrow. He actually, I did a taco giveaway last night. So he, <laughs> yes, tacos. Um, I've got to get in touch with him and hook him up. So BT, I didn't forget. It's been a busy day. So I'll, I'll get with you, buddy. We'll get you hooked up with some tacos. All right. Sweet. All right. Nice. Well, thank you, Tony, once again. And you guys have a great night. Stay safe, all of you. And Tony, you as well. And uh, Thanks, buddy. we'll catch you all next time. See you guys.